Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynn Weil, Director of External Affairs for CESA, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. Today, we'll discuss cooperation on critical and emerging technologies among members of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, taking a close look at opportunities for greater AI collaboration among Quad partners, as described in a recently published CSET report. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and you experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Please don't use the chat for anything else just yet. And now it's time to turn the mic over to our moderator. Martin Rasser is a senior fellow and director of the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Before joining CNAS, he served as a senior intelligence officer and analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency, where he worked on foreign emerging technologies, technology innovation, and weapons research and development. He also served as a senior advisor in the office of the Secu Secretary of Defense, special advisor to a senior military commander in the Middle East, and chief counterterrorism liaison to a US military unit in Iraq. Upon leaving government service, he was chief of staff at Muddy Waters Capital, an investment research firm. More recently, he was director of analysis at Kindy, a venture-backed AI startup in Silicon Valley. Martin, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Lynn, for that kind introduction. It is a real pleasure to be here today for what promised to be a very uh, informative and uh, you know just well-rounded discussion. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this topic. I've done a lot of work on thinking about how the United States can better engage with allies and partners on a whole host of tech policy issues. And today, of course, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and in particular, we're going to talk about um, how the Quad, which is a grouping consisting of the United States, Australia, India, and Japan, can work together more effectively in this very important technology area. Now, CSET has produced a very important issue brief on this very topic, and we're fortunate to have two of the authors for this important work to join us today. Um, so we have uh, uh, Hussan Shahal, who's a research analyst at CSET. Um, she previously worked at the World Bank's Corporate Security Division and also at Prevalent Inc., a cybersecurity risk management firm. Uh, our other featured speaker today is Noor Luang. Uh, she uh, is also a research analyst at CSET. In addition, she's also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council and previously worked at the Center for American Progress. Um, so what we'll do is I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Hussan and Noor to do a presentation of some of the key takeaways of their research, and then we'll reconvene for a Q&A session. And I encourage everyone watching to join us by posing questions. You can post those in the chat field and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to our featured speakers. Thank you so much, Martin, for that generous introduction. And thank you everyone for, for your interest in CSAT's research. It's really heartwarming to see so many of you join us for this talk today. So my colleagues, Noor and I, are really excited to be able to present the findings of this very comprehensive report that we published just recently around the Quad Summit in Tokyo last month. We'd love to dive into our findings, and I'll just take a second to share my screen. So again, thank you everyone for being here. Today, we look to examine how we can boost uh, AI collaboration between the four quad countries, that is the United States, Australia, India, and Japan, building upon some of the recent work we've been doing uh, on this topic at CSET. Now, as part of our research, we spent a good deal of time examining the four quad countries, their AI sectors, and how can they collaborate with each other on AI. But the question to start with here is, why does it really even matter to look at quads AI collaboration? Now, I'll walk you through some of the reasons for why studying quads AI collaboration is important, but I'll just begin by broadly stating that each of the Quad members share, have, have shared interests and unique advantages in AI development, and the Quad grouping is a promising forum with the potential to offer a multilateral alternative to China's techno-authoritarian model of technology development. When we talk about shared interests, 
we see ample evidence of similarity in thinking. And this is both when we look at each of the four countries' national priorities, and also what they have jointly brought to the agenda through the Quad Forum. All, of, all four Quad countries have recognized the value of AI for their future prosperity and security. And over the last five years, each of them have released national AI strategies. Therefore, it is no surprise that when the Quad started meeting a lot more together as a group, especially recently since 2020, emerging technologies quickly became the core of the Quad agenda. We saw that the four established the Quad Critical and Emerging Technology Working Group in March 2021 in order to coordinate their joint efforts. We also saw them set up contact groups on advanced communications and AI, launch a semiconductor supply chain initiative, and most recently, they have set up mechanisms for harnessing data for maritime awareness in the Indo-Pacific Indo Indo region. Not only shared interests, but each of the Quad members also has unique advantages that they bring to the table when it comes to AI collaboration. India, for instance, has a massive tech talent pool, while Australia has a highly developed digital economy and a high-skilled high workforce. Japan is a global leader in robotics, automation, and commercialization of tech breakthroughs. And the, the United States is in, investing heavily in AI across the board. This is from AI workforce and education initiatives to ramping up domestic AI chips production and also just greater resources for AI R&D. Therefore, when it comes to technology collaboration, having these unique advantages mean that the Quad countries can leverage each other's relative strengths, they can maximize the advantages of scale and also avoid duplicated efforts in order to foster innovation. Thirdly, I'll say that the Quad often gets criticized for being too informal or unstructured to be effective. But really, it's flexible structure resting on top of a foundation of several bilateral and multilateral initiatives is actually its strength. The Quad does not have a permanent secretariat, it has no formal agreements, and this arrangement actually allows for a lot more opportunities for experimentation and also agility in collective efforts, including, for example, the option to expand Quad's efforts in a Quad Plus arrangement and much more. Finally, the Quad offers one of the strongest alternatives to China's digital authoritarianism in the Indo-Pacific region. And when I say digital authoritarianism, I mean, for instance, China's development and export of surveillance technologies that facilitate repression, and also for that matter, China's economically coercive measures to suppress competition. As the four leading democracies in the Indo-Pacific region, the Quad presents a vision for AI leadership that is rooted in democratic values, and the grouping can be seen as one of the stronger collective efforts to curb China's regional authoritarian behavior. A combination of all these factors is why we stepped in and in initiated this project, assessing the Quad's AI capabilities and potential for collaboration. Drawing from a variety of original data sets we have at CSET and primary data sources, we explored trends and considered pathways for future AI collaboration in the Quad. And we do this across two key metrics pertinent to AI development that is AI research and, and the investments flowing into AI companies. Now, we understand that uh, these are only two dimensions of a multifaceted regional partnership. And also understand that research collaborations and investment flows between countries are often seen as separate from diplomatic initiatives and security issues. Having said that, it is important to remember that both these indicators are crucial for fueling innovation and new breakthroughs. And as the Quad countries begin prioritizing emerging technologies in their joint agenda, there is a lot they can do diplomatically by tapping into their research and financial community, and also a lot in mitigating potential security risks by, by identifying individual and shared interests and also threats in these two crucial drivers uh, of AI development. During our presentation today, we'll walk you through some of our most important findings across these two indicators, and we'll conclude with some uh, takeaways and reflections on what can the four countries do in AI moving ahead. But first, let me turn it over to Noor to give us the key takeaways of this presentation. Yes, and before we get going, we want to preview our key takeaways from the report, looking at the two indicators that Hussain has mentioned. First, we found that each of the core countries is an important global player, given that they are among the global leaders in AI research and at the same time has robust AI investment markets. Second, with that in mind, we are also interested in assessing the extent to which they leverage each other's strength. And we found that they're not doing that as much. In particular, Australia, India, and Japan collaborate extensively with the United States, but much less with one another. And third, 
while the Quad has not explicitly and collectively named China as a competitor, the Quad countries have shared concerns over China's destructive behavior in the region. And China has also campaigned aggressively against the Quad as well. And so after examining AI-related ties between the Quad countries and China, we found that all of the Quad countries have varying but fruitful AI research and investment linkages to China. And finally, as a whole, even though there are challenges to the Quad as a group, the four countries have taken initial steps to demonstrate their commitment to technology collaboration. And the Quad has established working groups and contact groups that Husan has mentioned with a focus on emerging technology and specifically on AI. And so with that in mind, it's pretty clear that the Quad agenda has evolved into something to include technology collaboration. And so Quad leaders increasingly view the Quad as a forum to build trust, identify opportunities for joint AI collaboration, especially particularly in research, and gather AI entrepreneurs and investors that increase and diversify technology collaboration. And this presents many opportunities for future collaboration around AI. And with that, over back to Hassan to discuss our work on AI research. Sure, Noor. So first we start by looking at AI research, which is an important indicator of AI innovation and scientific break breakthroughs. We first look at the uh, Quad's overall AI research output. Then we look at the individual areas of focus within AI. Then we look at the patterns of research collaboration to see how they work with each other. And finally, also how they work with China. So let me get into the details here because they're quite interesting. So when we looked at our data to see where the Quad countries stand when you evaluate the global production of AI relevant scholarly papers, it was very interesting to see that all four Quad countries are ranked among the top 10 AI research producers in the world. As you can see here, the United States ranks second in the world. India is third, Japan is fifth, and Australia is eighth globally. In fact, taken together as a group, the Quad countries have collecti co collectively published more than 640,000 AI papers over the past decade, which is more than the number of AI papers published by all of the European Union and ASEAN countries combined. In addition to overall research trends, we were curious to see in what particular subfields do, do each of these countries excel. In the chart here on the right are some selected AI fields which we observed as areas of relative strengths. In, in other words, these are fields where each of the Quad countries paper production was uniquely high. For instance, Japan's AI research production stood out in robotics related fields like simulation and human computer interaction. India stood out um, in fields that rely on large databases at scale like data mining and data science. Australia's production was high in more mathematical uh, fields like theoretical computer science and also in linguistics. And the United States stood out in key AI fields like machine learning and natural language processing. This analysis gave us a general picture of which AI subfields did researchers in each of the Quad countries focus on to understand their overall AI ecosystems, and more importantly, which fields can be potentially leveraged for joint opportunities multilaterally. Next, we wanted to see how much of this research produced by the Quad countries was done in collaboration and with whom. So we first started out by analyzing patterns of collaboration, which is pattern, uh, patterns in um, co-authorship of AI papers between each of the Quad countries. Now, I should say that uh, we found some of the most interesting trends of our study in this section. What was immediately evident to us was that Australia, India, and Japan each collaborate the most with the United States. As you can see in this chart, 22% of India's internationally co-authored papers were with researchers in the US. And this figure is 19% for both Australia and Japan. Therefore, United States stood out as the top research partner for these three countries. In comparison to this, we can see that collaboration rates between AI researchers from the Indo-Pacific Quad countries, that is uh, Australia, India, and Japan, were much lower. For Australia, India and Japan do not even rank in, rank in the top 10. For Japan, they rank in the top 10, but they are st still so much lower. Overall, for all three, collaboration rates with each other don't exceed 4% of each country's respective co-authored AI publications. Therefore, this pattern of AI collaboration somewhat resembled a hub spoke model with the United States at the center as the hub and Australia, India, and Japan as the outlying points or spokes each connected to the hub, but not as connected to each other. Next, we, we look to, to evaluate how each of the Quad countries collaborated with China. 
and we saw that China stood out as the top research partner for the United States. In fact, over the past decade, nearly 17% of America's internationally co-authored AI papers were with their Chinese counterparts, which comes down to about 56,000 papers, which, is act which actually outweighs US research co-authorships with the rest of its quad partners taken together. On the other hand, for Australia, India, and Japan, China is the second most co-authored country, falling right behind the United States. Collaboration rates with Chinese scholars account for 16% of Japan's internationally co-authored papers. And this is 12% for Australia, and for India, it is slightly lesser at 5%. Now, what is, what is clearly evident in this chart though is that Australia, India, and Japan each have stronger ties with China than they do with each other. So to sum it up, our AI research section indicated that all four quad countries are among the top AI research producers in the world, with each of the quad countries having relative strengths in key AI subfields that can be leveraged for joint opportunities. But Australia, India, and Japan collaborate much lesser with each other in comparison to how much they collaborate with the US. And China continues to be a strong AI research partner for each of them. And with that, now over to Noor to help us better understand the AI investment plans for Quad. Thanks, Hassan. And before we dive into the AI investment trends involving the Quad countries, I want to note up front here that we study cross-border AI investment to help us better understand where capital goes to support the development of AI, especially in the commercial sector, and how closely interlinked countries' financial ecosystems are to one another as well. And with that, we'll first take a look at the development of the Quad country's AI investment ecosystem, then their investment activity with one another, and finally their ties to China. Now, looking at each of the Quad country AI investment ecosystems here, the United States has the largest AI market, followed by India, Japan, and Australia. And when we look at the distribution of investors, as you can see here in the figure, we notice that the domestic investors are more active than foreign investors in each of the Quad countries AI investment markets. There are certainly reasons to why they have a preference for domestic AI markets over foreign investment opportunities. For example, they may be, there may be lower costs of doing business at home. There are lower barriers to entry. For example, investors may have a local network for information gathering and deal sourcing. And foreign investors are really important players as well. A vibrant AI investment ecosystem has the ability to attract both foreign and domestic investors. And so for the rest of the, this part of the presentation, we'll look closely at the Quad's cross-border investment flows. Here are important findings from the report that I want to highlight today. And I want to draw your attention to the first row of the figure on the left. Here we see that the United States comes up as the most active foreign investor in Indian, Japanese, and Australian AI companies. And this hardly comes as a surprise given the massive size of US investment um, ecosystem at home. But at the same time, when it comes to AI investment activity between the three Indo-Pacific countries, there appears to be relatively little. Well, having said that, when we zoom in to closely examine their cross-border investment tides, we found that there is some activity. In fact, their AI investment relationship occurs mostly between Japan and India, more than the ties between India and Australia or Japan and Australia. And also should point out that Japan India investment ties are mainly one-sided, meaning that there's more investment coming from Japan to India than from India to Japan. And what this tells us is that Japanese investors are more excited about Indian AI companies. And the patterns you're seeing here may be in part supported by an agreement between the Japanese and Indian government, namely the Japan India Digital Partnership Agreement, which basically aims to get more investors from Japan to finance Indian startups. And here, of course, we wanna further understand the Quad country's engagement beyond the network itself. And China is certainly an important player to closely observe. And we found that AI investment activity between China and the United States far exceeds investment ties between 
China and each of the Quad countries in the Indo-Pacific region. And as you can clear see, clearly see here in the first two rows of the table on the right, it's also important to note that US and China AI investment targets are stronger than any of the targets that we examine in the report. What's more is that similar to the trends that we've seen in the quads in uh, quad countries AI investment um, and research collaboration, China has different but, ro but robust AI investment ties with the three Indo-Pacific countries. For example, when we look closely at the China-Japan relationship, as you can see in the table, Chinese AI companies frequently attract investment from Japanese investors. But China, India, and AI investment ties exhibit the opposite trends with Chinese investors targeting more of Indian AI companies. And from the Quad's perspective, it is important to note that Japan, India, and Australia each have more AI investment activity with China than they do with one another. Although again, it's not surprising given China's massive market and outreach, it is still significant for the Quad countries to understand the state of their economic and financial linkages to China, especially as they're addressing security and technology concerns vis-a-vis -vis China. And so to sum up here, some of the Quad countries, each of them um, has a vibrant and growing AI research community and investment market. But Australia, Japan, and India mostly look towards the United States for collaboration more than they do with one another. And finally, each of the Quad countries has closer ties to China than to one another as well. And we do recognize here that Scientific research collaboration and financial activities are often seen as separate from dip diplomatic initiatives and security concerns. But as the Quad agenda evolves to prioritize te technology collaboration, it's important that they leverage each other's individual advantages, realign interests and commitment, and get closer diplomatically by tapping into their research and financial community. And so identifying gaps in AI collaboration across the Quad really allows us to locate potential opportunities for all members of the Quad to strengthen ties with one another as well. And with that, I'm going to turn over back to Asan to discuss potential future pathways for collaboration. That's great, Noor. So as we saw, our findings from both the research and investment section indicate that the ties that bind Australia, India, and Japan to each other are weaker than those that connect these countries to the United States. In fact, all four Quad members are interlinked with China's vast AI ecosystem, whether through joint research endeavors or through financial investments. Along with this, they also face several non-negligible barriers to technology cooperation, including differing approaches in data governance, varying economic or technological capabilities, and divergent geopolitical priorities. So therefore, in order to deliver on the Quad's goal of advancing tech cooperation, we need to deepen and expand existing collaboration efforts and also forge new pathways where few exist. There are potential opportunities that stakeholders in the four countries can consider in this regard. On the research side, we can look to capitalize on areas of individual research excellence to tackle cha challenges common to all. One example in this regard is leveraging AI for disaster prediction in the Indo-Pacific, considering that all four quad countries are increasingly vulnerable to natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. Some bilateral efforts, for example, between the, the US and Japan are already underway in this regard. And replicating this to focus on AI research partnerships with the rest of the Quad members could be a good way forward. Another area that fits well for collaborative research is on privacy preserving machine learning techniques or PPML techniques, which are basically techniques that allow multiple parties to work together on data sets without sharing personally identifiable information. This can allow researchers from different institutions and countries to work together on AI without concerns about sensitive data, which we know is a common cause of concern that creeps up in bilateral or multilateral collaboration efforts. PPML techniques can go a long way in overcoming obstacles to collaboration pertaining to privacy concerns and differing approaches to data governance. And with that, over to Noor for some thoughts on the investment side of things. Yes, on the investment side, one approach that the Quad can explore is to introduce targeted reforms to attract capital and reduce barriers to foreign investment in each of their um, tech sectors. Some initiatives are already underway, um, such as the newly announced Quad Investors Network, 
which aims to bring together investors to increase access to capital for emerging technology within and across the Quad countries. Another approach that Quad, the Quad can explore is to coordinate on multilateral protective measures, such as export controls and investment screening regimes. Each Quad country in different capacity has begun thinking about the best approach to navigate issues related to China's checks transfer, misuse of technology for human rights violation, as well as China's use of technology to improve the country's military strength. And so as the Quad countries are doing that, it's important to, um, it's important that they coordinate and facilitate information sharing and resource sharing um, across like-minded countries in order to maximize their effectiveness, um, especially for the tools itself and minimize the harms to, to their individual industries. So with that, I'll turn back to Son to wrap up the presentation for us. So to sum, it, uh, to sum up all that we learned today, we can say that trends in AI-related research collaboration and investment flows into AI companies point that Quad countries are global leaders in AI with relative strengths in important fields. Moving on, they can leverage each other's strengths in order to pursue more joint opportunities. And while admittedly, creating opportunities and securing funding for international AI-related re research projects can be challenging, but focusing on initiatives that tackle common challenges to all can go a long way in delivering success and, and have real promise. We also saw that across both the metrics, Australia, India, and Japan have closer AI-related ties with the United States and little with each other. In order to make the most of their partnership and also to bolster its status of, as, as a hub of technology, the court should focus on moving away from this hub-spoke model with the US at the center to, to one that strengthens ties between, between all of its members. The court can do so by recognizing this as a priority, such that future court initiatives can look to tailor efforts that help boost AI research partnerships or incentivize AI investment activities, particularly between the three Indo-Pacific countries. And finally, each of the Quad countries have strong AI research and investment relationships with China. And the Quad can work to reduce this dependency on Chinese technologies and markets, particularly in areas pertinent to national security. It can do so by coordinating more closely on export controls and investment screening measures to better protect their sensitive and dual use technologies. I'd like to close by saying that we have a wonderful team at CSAT uh, that worked on this project and we continue to work on related projects. I want to thank these folks here for all their efforts in contributing to this research and many others at CSET and beyond who have continued to provide uh, critical support in the form of feedbacks, reviews, edits, and much more. And finally, you can read this report and find more information on our, on our website listed here. You can subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, here are our emails and Twitter handles. That's all uh, I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening. Well, Hussan and Noor, thank you very, very much for that very thorough and informative presentation. Uh, absolutely fantastic. There's a lot of important takeaways in there, um, and I'm very much looking forward to, to digging into the implications of some of those takeaways. But um, to start off, let's uh, take a step back and look at this issue from uh, um, a broader perspective. And, and I'd like uh, each of you to, to talk a bit about why tech cooperation amongst the Quad member states is so important. What is the bigger picture impact of that type of relationship? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can take a first stab at this. Um, thanks, Martin. It's, it's such an important topic. And as you know, the Quad agenda has um, now mature and recently developed uh, very quickly in the past couple of years uh, to look at emerging technology in particular. Um, and AI has also come up as a, an important technology that these countries want to further develop as well. And as Susan has I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, um, each of the Quad countries has developed its own and published its own um, AI national strategies. And so it's really important for these countries to you know, work together and think about the best way to um, first to take a look at um, how they can roll closer to one another, but also at the same time, I think the, uh, the bonus to that, um, the bonus of having closer alliance and partnership um, is to create a model where other countries can, can take a look at and say, um, these are different areas where multiple countries, like-minded countries in particular, can work together and establish 
a, a model and a base for, um, especially for democratic countries to align um, and develop AI that um, could be valuable for, um, for further development of uh, democracy. So with that, I'll pass it back to Hassan for further thoughts on this. Yes, sorry about that. I had a lot of things come up, come up on my screen that uh, did block my uh, line of thinking, but um, I see that uh, th there's a lot that technology co cooperation can offer. Um, I would say for that matter, um, tech is one of the easier areas for, for allies and partners to collaborate on policies. And also perhaps one of the most impactful ones because any, any progress in, in, in technology and AI is likely to reverberate in other areas like uh, economic growth uh, in military success. And, um, and in, in contrast to, for example, the Chinese model, it can bring a lot more equity and build the future on the right principles. So, so in that sense, um, it's definitely an important area uh, that uh, for poor countries to collaborate and also something that uh, these countries have been um, bringing up a lot more in, in their recent organizations. Great. Well, thank you both uh, very much for that. Um, just want to remind our audience that you can uh, contribute to the conversation by uh, posting your questions in the chat field. So please do so. We already have a few uh, coming in, so I'll get to those in, in just a moment. Um, but I, I want to turn to uh, what I found one of the most interesting uh, points made in your report was you know, this notion of a hub spoke model, right, where there's a lot of uh, AI research and investment in, in the AI sphere taking place between the United States and, and the other quad countries individually. There's not much happening between the other quad countries. Can you talk a little bit about why it is in the US interest for India, Japan, and Australia to work together more effectively amongst each other in this field? Yeah, sure, absolutely, you know, uh, Martin. Um, it's, it is actually uh, clear from, I would say, I'll begin by saying that the US strategy itself uh, like has, uh, has mentioned that it is, the US is interested in, in cultivating stronger ties between its allies and partners. And uh, not only individually uh, US stronger ties uh, with each of its allies, but more cultivating um, stronger ties between all of its uh, partners. And this is, this is very evident when you read the, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy document from uh, February 2022, um, but but more than that, really, it's it is it is the new reality uh, we are in, where the United States is um, not the, the hegemon and it's operating in a more multipolar world, and um, it's it's in the U.S. interest to strengthen collaboration in regions that align with its values and interests, and um, and, and 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 get and, and so that they can be those centers of power uh, when it needs them. Uh, moreover, I would say in general, it's, it's really good to have diversified portfolios and diverse research collaboration. If you, if you truly want to foster innovation and have cutting edge, uh, uh, cutting edge breakthroughs. And um, I, I would say that we know from research that diverse teams build uh, better and more resilient and more trustworthy technologies, specifically AI technologies. And this is because among other things, um, diverse teams are likely to avoid uh, letting individual biases in programming. Uh, there's also ample evidence to prove that uh, diverse teams are also likely to drive superior results. Um, Netflix in 2006, for instance, had announced um, a one uh, billion uh, one million dollar award uh, program, and uh, for any team that could create a successful prototype of its now famous uh, uh, recommendation engine. So, and the, the winning, winning team had competed with almost 20,000 other teams from 150 other countries uh, through multiple rounds. And in the uh, later uh, phases of the, the contest, uh, uh, the, the teams gradually began to merge with each other. And the winning team was actually a combination of three other teams. So therefore I would say it's absolutely true. It's, it's uh, the diversity of teams uh, that actually bring those people to people ties and brings uh, that exposure, that experience, and um, and it's it's really important uh, to kind of like ensure that uh, you have more diversity in, uh, in in building technologies together. So hence, US definitely um, uh, it's in the US interest to to uh, partner with its allies and ensure that this happens more. Oh, fantastic, Hussam. Thank you, uh, uh, Nor. Anything you'd like to to add to that? 
Yeah, um, just want to quickly add another point here uh, to Son's point about um, it is in the US interest to move away from the hub spoke model. Um, what the US can do is perhaps the US could be wearing two hats. One is becoming a convener um, to simply get people in the same room. Um, and it has demonstrated you know, the ability to do that, um, as we can clearly see in the one of the initiatives that the Quad has come up with, uh, which is to establish a fellowship and you know, establish research agenda to, um, to make sure that uh, these four countries are moving towards one another. Another um, hat that the US can wear is becoming a funder. Um, and that could potentially be, you know, meaning it could be a part of the uh, invest the Quad's investing network, uh, which you've already seen is one of the initiatives that came out of the, the latest Quad Summit as well. But I think what the U.S. can do, uh, the U.S. can do, you know, so much um, in, in doing all of these things. But I think the real answer is, you know, it's really up to the four countries to decide and um, you know, find opportunities to explore different pathways to further fosters, um, foster the collaboration with one another. And here, currently, we see that there is uh, momentum going on, and uh, as well as tremendous opportunities to explore tech alliance and um, different collaboration pathways that can shift the way from dependencies on, on China as well, um, and moving towards one another, not just within the United States, but also the three Indo-Pacific countries um, moving closer to, to each other. Um, and so, yeah, currently there's a great incentive and I think um, would be a lost opportunity if they don't uh, take action at the moment. So turn it back to Martin. Well, thank you. I'd like to turn to a question from one of our uh, audience members. Uh, this is one is from Scott Malcolmson. And um, this is a, it's an interesting question, right? Because uh, you, you've all laid out in your report, there's a lot of shared interests and complementary strengths. There are, of course, differences between uh, the four countries as well. And this one in particular um, is about Japanese uh, Res potential resistance to conducting AI research that might have dual use purposes. Right? So getting at uh, Japan's history of, of a more pacifist stance. Um, did this issue come up during your research? And if so, how do you think that is uh, impacting the potential for collaboration amongst the Quad partners? Yes, certainly, Martin. Uh, I would say that when we evaluated research ties uh, between the Quad countries, um, I it, the trend about each of the Quad countries collaborating with the US so much more than they were collaborating with each other did, did stand out. And Japan is certainly like also, um, it, it, it is following the trend. It, it's, it is disproportionately um, collaborating a lot more with US and China, which are its top two collaborators and with which uh, Japan is collaborating a bigger percentage of its co-authored papers versus any of the other countries. So, so in that sense, certainly, um, it does stand out, but I would I would just generally say that that some research often um, is that there, there, there are compendium of reasons why for why this could have been the case. But my my personal take on this is that it's it's not really that there is a specific disincentive for collaboration between the, these three countries that is Australia and Japan and like even for Japan, um, but it's more so that. Uh, collaboration with each other was not just prioritized. Um, there's there have not been specific disincentives or roadblocks that I can say which were like decisive in in, in blocking it. Uh, but it's more that it, the collaboration has under has remained underexplored. Um, we 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 found although we found relatively limited collaboration between Australia and then Japan, that doesn't mean that collaboration cannot flourish. And we don't mean to underplay the potential for such collaboration. Um, each of these countries have their own areas of excellence that can be leveraged while working together. Uh, not only that, each of these countries have uh, something that the other needs, as, as we had discussed earlier. It's just more about prioritizing and undertaking greater initiatives for collaboration. Nora, uh, any uh, thoughts on this particular point? I think Lassan has covered, covered this question very perfectly. Um, I would just add that I think Japan has also become an important player and it has been um, in the Indo-Pacific region and has demonstrated interest in becoming even a stronger player, um, as you can see in you know, its participation in the uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework you know, with the United States um, and has been really wanted to um, become more engaged in the region. And so I think 
with in this regards, um, we'll probably see more activities coming coming from Japan. Um, and certainly there are barriers and, and Nixon has addressed that um, uh, really well. And uh, there's a lot to observe in this in this area here. So let's, uh, let's turn to the China factor and all of this. So you pointed out that there's considerable AI research and investment links between the quad member countries and China. We have two questions from the audience related to this point. Um, one is from David Chin. Um, he asks whether uh, collaboration amongst the quad member states can take place without the partici uh, participation of Chinese nationals. And another related question is from Jinsi William, oh, Wilson. And Jinsi um, is wondering, what do you think might precipitate a, a decoupling from China? What would that look like? And would that necessarily be something the Quad members would want to have happen in order to foster greater collaboration amongst themselves? Yeah, certainly, uh, certainly, Martin. I'll, I'll just begin by saying that uh, decoupling uh, or disentanglement, complete disentanglement is actually incredibly complex and it's very unlikely to be complete and, uh, and potentially likely to backfire in, un, in unintended ways. Um, I would say that instead we can think of um, moderating and even blocking certain relationships and interactions in national security sensitive arenas. Uh, we can think of multilateral uh, screening controls export controls, raising much more awareness about research security issues, um, raising awareness across governments and between governments about um, potentially uh, questionable behaviors and, and practices of um, individuals and companies. But um, it, at least in the, in the short to, to medium term, the, the economic or political consequences of complete disentanglement may be prohibitive. Um, we, sh we shouldn't see this as a one size fit all for every single realm. Because uh, you know, in, in certain areas, uh, uh, cooperation is certainly, I would say, a necessary. It is b unavoidable, and and c it's is potentially very useful. Um, we just have to design smart policies that are um, that are fit to the challenges that we are facing. Um, yeah, so we just had another uh, question along these lines come in. This one's from uh, Drisha Antos. Um, so she makes the observation that the quad countries AI ecosystems are very deeply intertwined with China's AI, AI market. Um, could you dig a little deeper on how significant of an obstacle you see that as being uh, to fostering and developing AI collaboration, or maybe uh, you'd like to take an initial cut at that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the China factor obviously is very important to address here. Um, and uh, China is, uh, as we discussed earlier, is a global player, both in the you know, research community and also in the investment space. Um, and I can speak a little bit from the perspective of what China has been doing uh, you know, internationally in, the, uh, in terms of its market outreach and also um, the size of its uh, financial market. Um, I think from the from the investment perspective, it's it's really complex that um, the fact that all th four quad countries have deep in, uh, financial ties with China, and it's really it's really hard to say currently that um, there will be you know complete disentanglement, as Susanna said. Like with moderation, though, policy smart policies will should probably come. Um, with some situation, you know, first with situational awareness, um, just first taking a closer look at how deeply tied each of the Quad countries um, um, are to, you know, to China. And, you know, like uh, I, I would probably should um, bring up the fact that uh, the US has already thought about potentially proposing a um, you know, about investment screening regime that could potentially uh, prohibit any capital flow into, um, into China in support of its technology development. And when we, when we looked at that, um, we see that, you know, one of the potential way that the Quad countries can do is to coordinate on information sharing. If they want to pursue um, this approach to, you know, restrict any capital flow into China or restrict any Chinese capital flow into their tech sector, you know, access, restricting accessing to, um, 
uh, any uh, technology developed in their uh, respective country, it's important that they get together and, and um, share information on that. And also, um, there could potentially be barriers to that. Um, for example, like if you don't include industry players into this conversation, you might not get industry actors to be on board with this. And so um, there's one way to think about this. I think, you know, to answer your question about um, how do you think about, you know, uh, Chinese, dis uh, Chinese engagement with this is to encourage, one is to encourage industry players to get on board and get behind the export control regimes that allows them to have fair competition, you know, not just with um, the, the Quad countries, but also with other allies and partners and um, to also form joint investment opportunities where they can together foster innovation within their own tech sector. Um, or else they might, if they were to do it alone, pursuing this opportunity alone, they could stand to lose um, if their respective government stakeholders were to, you know, propose this policy multi uh, unilaterally. Excuse me. Um, so with that, I'll I'll turn to Asana to think about, you know, tell us a little bit about what uh, we can do in terms of um, our, our research collaboration with China. Definitely. Um, yeah. So I, to, to answer your question, Martin, I feel like uh, so it it was if you ask me. For the Quad, uh, it was the increased, um, increasing Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific region was one of the factors that probably would have, uh, that probably brought the Quad countries together to cooperate more. But it was, it's also like, but interestingly, China's also a particularly negative subject that none of them agree on. So, so in that sense, um, there is, you can say that there is, there, there, there is at least as of now, a lack of consensus on how to potentially deter uh, Beijing. Um, and which is not very detrimental, if you ask me, uh, for, for, for many reasons at this stage. Uh, but the, the, the only scenario that I, like, if I have to possibly think of the future, like in assuming a scenario where there's been a particularly aggressive overture by China in, in, in the Indo-Pacific, and let's say in the South China Sea or vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, and, um, and, and the, I mean, there's likely to be lack of consensus on how to go forward with it if you consider if you take one um, as of today, um, and this is this is mostly because Australia and Japan, for, for instance, they've signed a lot of economic pacts and free trade uh, deals with China, uh, which reflect their desire to kind of continue doing business with China, um, even as they might be willing to work to uh, deter its growing growing clout in the region. India, on the other hand, might be willing to help with capacity building, but it may not be ready to actually take uh, any risks that might involve um, violence or escalation in, in, let's say, in the South China Sea that could upset the situation for its territorial borders with China. Um, and the US is willing to intervene uh, in any way to safeguard its interests and make the right investments to compete with China. So in that sense, like, so yeah, vis-a-vis -vis China, I would say, like, this is the one potential uh, scenario that I can imagine, but yeah. Well, excellent. Uh, let's turn to export controls and outbound investment screening. Uh, uh, Husan, you mentioned that in one of your answers a little while ago, nor you uh, touched on that during the presentation. Uh, so we have a few questions coming in on this specific issue. Um, one is from your colleague, uh, Bill Hannes. Uh, he notes that you know, three of the four Quad countries exhibit various degrees of concern over China's efforts to obtain advanced technologies, including AI from abroad, uh, using what he calls, uh, quote unquote, informal means. Um, so how does that impact India specifically, uh, given their uh, stance as an indigenous AI power? More broadly, uh, this is a question from uh, Andres de Aragon. Ultimately, what would a more coordinated export control regime, outbound investment screening regime for the Quad look like? Um, what would be the foundational aspects? And do, and do you see the potential for alignment between the four Quad countries on this so that you could have a more effective regime? Who would like to take that first? <laughs> I can I can jump in to, to speak about the second part a little bit and then I'll pass it on to all of the parts. Um, I'll, I'll just begin by saying that um, export controls is a really it's it's a complicated area that's undergoing important changes and it's it's actually fast changing arena. And one one uh, one clear point I would say in implementing export controls 
is that it is viable to do so in a multilateral fashion. And uh, they, they very rarely tend to be effective if only one country, and even if that country is the United States, uh, is uh, putting them in place. Um, and this is just because how globally intertwined and interlinked our uh, technology supply chains are. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, a lot of, uh, the, there are several conversations that are happening on export controls right now. And one that I'd definitely point out, uh, you out it, to is uh, by uh, our colleagues, uh, Emily uh, Weinstein and uh, Kevin Wolf uh, that actually have, uh, they've looked at, uh, they, they proposed, uh, so what they say is that the existing uh, export control regimes are probably unlikely uh, and not, they cannot uh, sort of handle the challenges that, ex uh, that, that the quad countries have. Uh, and also like the, 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 uh, the, the questions that we often kind of discuss vis-a-vis -vis quad. So in that sense, they've proposed a fifth uh, multilateral uh, export control regime as, as uh, something. And I would highly uh, recommend you to check the report out to, to learn more, more about that. And with that, I'll, I'll pass on to Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and yes, uh, the the report or um, article that both Emily and Kevin um, put out last month uh, explicitly and, and extensively talked about um, a proposal that they uh, have put together for a new multilateral export controls regime. And I have emphasized this before, and I um, should do it do it again. That if one of the Quad countries is thinking about, um, you know. The best practice to approach this issue, especially with, um, you know, to address the concerns they have over China's ability to to get um, technology transfer and uh, to access our um, technology capabilities, you know, within their respective technology sector. I think they they have to do it together. It's for what for one example is um, if a piece of technology is um, being blocked by the United States. Um, that piece of technology can also be accessed by China uh, through you know, the Japanese market or the Australian market. So better coordination on that would be really crucial to actually maximize the ineffectiveness of the tool being used. Um, and another thing I would say is that for outbound investment screening regime, um, I think you know, um, the fact that each of these countries have, have already demonstrated that they want to think about um, the best way to approach this issue. And to, sim to simply say it, the train has already left the station. Um, and you know, it's really important that industry actors can get on board with this um, to effectively coordinate um, and, and implement such policies if they were to be implemented, right? So um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly say, um, uh, make this remark, uh, emphasize that. Great, thank you. Um, so one question here, this is uh, specifically on uh, investing. Uh, so Noor, maybe uh, you wanna field this one. Uh, did you come across any specific barriers to cross-border investments between uh, the Quad partner countries? And I think specifically given that, um, that hub and spoke issue that, that you both spoke of earlier, uh, particularly between Japan, Australia, and India, are there specific barriers that you came across that you think may pose an impediment to more effective collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we certainly noted, noticed that um, there is little investment activity between the three Quad countries, as, um, as uh, you've seen in the presentation. Um, but at the same time, um, I think w the, a couple of barriers to cross-border investment, just simply, you know, general speak, generally speaking, um, cross-border investments, uh, some domestic investors just happen to stay at home. Um, and I listed a couple of uh, reasons for that, mainly because it's just easier to um, find, you know, companies to, to um, invest in, um, especially when the network is so close at home. Um, but at the same time, there is a lot to say about um, diversify, diversifying um, their investment portfolio by going to look for uh, companies that are offering, you know, um, production of a piece of technology that they're interested in. So, um, but between all of these countries, we noticed that, you know, a couple of, of uh, examples, for example, uh, one instance is, um, you know, between India and Japan, there is an agreement that kind of allows, um, or part of a reason that 
we might be seeing a lot of activities between Japan and India. And I noted that in the presentation as well. Um, and so from this finding, potentially say that, you know, moving forward, these countries could potentially think about forming, you know, targeted reforms that allow them to um, increase more capital flowing into each other's country. And so um, the incentives are there, the barriers are very hidden. Um, it's, it's more of what other opportunities that they can explore together. And also another point that I think it's worth mentioning is the fact that um, investment is becoming more globalized and really complex. A couple of investors can come together and jointly invest in companies. Um, and so, you know, Australian, Japanese, and Indian investors can um, put their heads together and, um, you know, come up with uh, come up with a fund that could potentially be used to focus on investment within their own ecosystem or within their uh, each other's ecosystem. So I think um, I guess to sum up here, um, the barriers are not very noticeable. I think incentives are probably um, more. There are more incentives right there to uh, to get these countries going. But I think you know. They have to recognize the the fact that there's not going there's not a lot going on between these three countries. Um, of the investments that uh, you did see taking place, do you have fidelity on on the nature of those investments? What, uh, for for example, the breakdown between venture capital, private equity, and mergers and acquisitions? Do, do you have uh, the details on those types of numbers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. In our, for our methodology, um, we looked at transactions that are you know, both um, venture capital investment, private equity. And I have to say that venture capital is a part of private equity as well, um, and merchant acquisitions as a separate part. Um, but they all help us track equity flow into companies from, from investors themselves. And um, one thing that I could say is that but for example, in Indian AI investment ecosystem, we see that there are way more interest in um, companies, you know, um, in companies attracting more investment from uh, at the early stage. So we see about 75% of the total investment transactions that we observe in the report coming from um, earlier investments, like for example, um, angel rounds, uh, series A and B, which are all venture capital investment. And so, um, there is certainly more activities in the VC space, um, relatively you know, more than the, the private equity space because just the nature of AI investment in general, there's a lot um, of startups that are raising capital from uh, investors in the early stage. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we are at the top of the hour. Uh, would you be uh, interested and available to go a little longer? Because there's a, a, a several more good questions in the queue. I'd love to get to those if, uh, if you guys would like. Yeah, got a thumbs up. How about you, Noor? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this next question, this is again a, a potential barrier. Um, and Catherine had a specifically asking about the Quad countries' uh, very different policies on issues such as data privacy. Could that potentially derail intra-Quad cooperation? Definitely, Martin. I would say that that's something that we have also identified as a potential problem um, in a potential barrier in quad uh, collaboration moving ahead. Um, and I mean, each of the uh, quad countries have their own uh, data sharing laws that may uh, may or may not be at, uh, at conflict with each other. For and um, I would say, in particular, uh, India stands out as as an evident example. Uh, for instance, in in twenty nineteen. Um, India rejected Japan's um, Osaka, Osaka track, uh, a framework that, that promotes data transfers in favor of expanding data localization. So, 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 so certainly like it, it, it seems that it, it, it is a potential barrier, but at the same time, I, I should say that um, India is one of 80 countries that is uh, speaking about, uh, about data localization. And, um, and, and these, these, so in that sense, like these challenges are not very specific to Quad, but are likely to emerge in when you look at any uh, when you, when you look at uh, collaboration for between with any other uh, part part of the world. I would say. I mean, this is certainly an issue for for uh, EU and the US, for instance. Um, and and yeah, so in that uh, in, in 
that certainly I would say is is uh, is an issue for the quad, but it's not uh, detrimental and it's not certainly unique to the quad. Any uh, further thoughts on that, Noor? And I just emphasize the you know the fact that um, Hussan has mentioned that uh, privacy preserving machine learning technique would be one potential pathway for the quad to explore because mainly it's going to well, with that investment in such uh, uh, privacy preserving machine learning technique um, would allow the quad countries to at least their researchers to um, collaborate without any concerns over you know data privacy sharing and, and concerns and so um, that, that is one way they can they can further explore on that. Let's talk uh, international standard setting. So one concern that uh, a lot of leaders in, in democracies have expressed is that uh, you know, China's involvement in international standard setting and how China is essentially co-opting the system that was built up to, to promote its own technologies that largely uh, comport with their authoritarian values. So that then poses a direct threat to democratic values around the world. How do you see the Quad playing in that? Does the Quad have a role in helping to coordinate international standard setting so that technologies that align with democratic values have uh, a, a better fighting chance, uh, to, put it, to put it in one way? Yes, Martin, absolutely. This, uh, the Quad has been undertaking so many important measures, uh, and there's um, there's a lot of a very strong joint signaling um, when it comes to um, uh, standard setting uh, and specifically technology standard setting. I, I would say in its most recent summit, um, for instance, the Quad set up the International um, Standards Cooperation Network, where like-minded partners can can share information and technical standard activities to increase kind of awareness and um, cooperation in this domain. And in and previously they've uh, also set up uh, standards, uh, specific working groups uh, to coordinate standard setting for different technologies like AI and cybersecurity. And um, perhaps one of the most crucial joint initiatives by the Quad in, in the space was the launch of the Quad principles on technology design, development and uh, governance and, and use, I, that's what it's called. Um, through this document, they really laid out uh, a call to action for, for technology suppliers, vendors and distributors to to produce and maintain uh, secure systems. Um, and th this includes calling out 5G uh, diversification plans um, to ensure that they can enjoy 5G that is uh, not built by China, um, uh, or like at least the bad actors in China. Uh, and also they've also launched a semiconductor supply chain initiative and, and other things. So, so yeah, I would say that uh, there's, there's a lot that, that's, that they've been doing, and um, it's just important to note actually the nitty treaties that the Quad has already involved itself in uh, officially in this space. Um, and yeah, and I think like each of the four Quad countries are on the same page, if you ask me, on the broader picture, but they have, um, they, they may have like potential disagreements in terms of how to operationalize these principles, uh, mm -hmm. considering their domestic uh, environments. And, and they're, they're, I'm happy to dive into examples if, if, if it is needed, I will, um, but I, I will, for now, I'll just say that um, um, it's, it's actually something that is still work in progress uh, and it's likely to, it's likely will be challenges once they start operationalizing it. But as of now, um, they definitely are on the same page if you, if you look at like the slew of initiatives that they've launched on this. Excellent. Well, I'd like to uh, to close with uh, by combining a couple questions uh, that people have posed about uh, the the broader international picture on this. So, for one, um, what lessons, what positive benefits do you think um, the Quad's efforts in this area could have on on other tech focused groupings such as the the US EU Trade and Technology Council, uh, the recently announced EU India Trade and Technology Council. And what kind of benefits can can other US allies and partners uh, reap from more effective uh, collaboration and cooperation within the quad? Um, I'm happy to start. Uh... <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please, Susan. Yeah, so there is there's always uh, a lot that you can learn from each other. Um, I mean, Martin, that's, that, that goes without saying. And specifically when you have something like the Quad Forum, which is, uh, uh, is an informal uh, grouping and that's ready to engage with partners, 
ac across the board and and has done uh, in, in most recently in, in its squad plus arrangement and, and much more. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's certainly like a lot that the quad is uh, launching in terms of specific initiatives, uh, be it in uh, be it in AI cybersecurity, as you mentioned, standards and on, on 5Gs. And so a lot of, like I mentioned, like a lot of those nitty gritty uh, initiatives, which is very interesting. So there's certainly a lot of experience, so, uh, so certainly a lot that each of the other multilateral initiatives can, can learn from what the quad is doing. And, um, and yeah, and I would say that um, moving ahead, I guess, um, it's, it's more about, so quad being and it's often proposed that quad being that informal um, grouping it is um, can can potentially be a dialogue partner to to more formal groupings like ASEAN or uh, even others in 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 Europe um, as you mentioned and also the fact that and again I would reiterate that one of the strengths of the quad is the fact that it is uh, built on the like it's built on a foundation of existing trilateral and multilateral initiatives like you mentioned and that certainly is what contributes to, uh, to, to the quad strength and uh, uniformity in thinking and moving ahead, I guess, um, building much more on these multilateral initiatives across the board and continuing their engagement, which the quad itself has uh, indicated that it will uh, be doing, um, is, is, is definitely a strength and um, is important and will be prioritized. Great, thank you, Hassan. Uh, Noor, any uh, concluding thoughts on those questions? Yeah, I, I'll just briefly add, um, Hussan has made a really good point about the informal structure of the quad that allows for flexibility and also a lot of room for experimentation, um, especially, you know, emerging technology is a new area. And um, when you add security concerns as well, um, it's the topic is highly complicated. And we have a group of, um, you know, four leading democracies that can come together and, and experiment on a wide range of uh, issues related to technology and um, security. And so the first step, you know, the core countries can do is to first reach its full potential as a group, um, you know, by figuring out how to get closer to one another, as we mentioned throughout this entire uh, discussion, um, to then uh, present itself as a group that um, offers a model for other countries to um, to say if this model is successful, you know, um, it could be attractive to other countries, for example, South Korea, ASEAN countries, and, you know, potentially Euro European countries as well. And so um, there's also room for the Quad countries to each collaborate with other um, important players in the region and uh, in other regions as well in Europe. Um, so there, there's a lot to observe in this space. And um, hopefully in the future, CISA will come up with uh, more interesting research questions on, in the, on this topic. So more to come on that. Oh, fantastic. It's always great to end on a note with many more things coming down the pike. Uh, Hussan Noor, thank you so much. Uh, this was fantastic. And congratulations again on a great report. And uh, thank you very much to all the uh, members of the audience. Uh, tremendously good questions and a lot of them. We could easily go another 45 minutes, I think, based on the questions that are still in the queue. So I'm sorry we weren't able to, to get to them all, but uh, we'll, we'll tackle them at a future discussion, most certainly. So thank you all very much. And with that, I will turn it back over to Lynn. Thank you, Martin. And I'd like to echo your thanks to Hussan and uh, to Noor, as well as to everyone who attended today and, and took part. Your comments and questions were terrific, and we really would love to get to them all, but we did see them all. Um, if you'd like to learn more about CSET, please go to cset.georgetown.edu and sign up for our newsletter and our research updates. Our next webinar will take place on July 28th. It will feature Chike Agu, the Chief Innovation Officer at the U.S. Department of Labor, together with CSET's Anna Puglisi and Diana Gelhaus, discussing innovation and national competitiveness. The event will be called Creating an Innovation Workplace in Uncertain Times. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again real soon.